Hello and welcome. If you're new to my channel, my name is Christina, and in this week's video, I'm really excited to share five fun, easy DIY projects with you. I'm going to talk you through all the techniques, including the supplies. So let's head over to project one. I thought it would be really fun for a quick and easy project for home decor for the fall to use this Wool Ease Thick and Quick by Lion Brand. I want to demonstrate how easy this really is. So I'm going to use a crochet hook and it's just a 10 millimeter size. First thing I'm going to do is make a slip knot and I'm going to stitch on 35 stitches. What I want to do is actually create a decor pumpkin just using this thick and easy stitch yarn. I plan to actually use the entire roll of the yarn to make a larger size pumpkin. But the bonus of what I'm about to show you is I'm going to show you how easy it is to make a hat and then turn it into a pumpkin. It almost looks like a braid, really easy. Next step will be to make a double crochet. So what I'm going to do is yarn over my crochet hook, go into the second stitch, and what we're making is a double crochet by three loops down to two loops and remove two loops again. Really easy. It's just repetition. You always start with two loops on your crochet hook, yarn into your stitch. You'll have three stitches on your crochet hook. Then you're going to remove two, remove two again, then yarn over, start with two. It's just a repeat, that's it. It's so easy. So start with two, put your crochet hook into your next stitch. Now you have three loops, then you're gonna remove two, then you're gonna remove two again. Simple, easy, quick. This is a perfect way to practice when you just wanna make an even square learning how to crochet, whether it's a single crochet or a double crochet. At the end of your row, really important to add two extra stitches. Then what you're going to do is you're going to go into that next stitch, but now it looks like a braid almost at the top because there's two bumps. You're going to count that as one stitch. So with your crochet hook, you're going to grab the working yarn, remove two loops, remove two loops again, always make sure you yarn over. Again, it looks like two stitches, but you're going to count it as one. Pull the working yarn through with your crochet hook, remove two stitches, then remove two stitches again, yarn over. Just keep repeating. It's really quick and easy, I promise. It seems like it's a little bit tricky at first, but I guarantee you, once you catch it, you won't want to stop. You can make anything and everything when you want to crochet. I didn't count how many rows I did, I just ended up using the entire skein of yarn. So for the last stitch, just tie a knot with the remainder of the working yarn and weave in the tail. So now that we have just the standard basic square with double crochet, now I'm going to turn this into what is going to look like a hat. You'll need a little extra yarn of the same yarn that you used for your square and I'm gonna make a needle and thread just using a safety pin. Because this yarn is so bulky, it's really hard to find a needle that will actually fit it. So I'm gonna make a needle just using a safety pin. You're gonna take the two end stitches as you folded it in half, and all you're gonna do is cross over the yarn and basically stitch it together. Again, you're just basically weaving the yarn in between each stitch. So you're going to grab the stitch on one side, then grab the stitch on the other side. I'm actually going to turn this inside out so you can see it a little bit better. So as you can see, it's just crossing it over. So grab that end stitch, weave it on one side, grab the other side and weave it in. Once I'm done, I am now just going to tie and make a knot on each end. So now that I've sewed the square together, I'm going to turn it back inside out and I'm now going to use my same threading style to close the end. So all the way around the circle of one end, in and out, 
of the end stitch all the way around. Once I get to the very end, I'm going to pull it really tight. Then I'll make a knot. Once I've made the knot, I will actually poke the remainder of the tail inside. And once I'm finished this, I'll show you that you've actually made a hat. So I'll fold the end kind of on the outside there, just as you would a hat. But what we want to do is actually create a pumpkin, but it's kind of a two for one DIY. So it took me less than an hour to create that. Now what we're going to do is turn this into a pumpkin. So you're going to need some kind of fiber fill, or if you have some leftover small dish towels you're not using anymore and you want to recycle old stuff like that, you could use that as your fill. The objective of what I want though is I kind of want the bottom to be a little fat and the top to be a little bit thinner. And then I'm going to go and I am going to sew with the yarn and close the top the same way I did the bottom. And again, once I've sewed it all the way around, I'm going to pull it really, really tight. And then the ends of the tail, after I've made that knot, I'm just going to poke it inside. Next step I'm going to be using is jute rope. You can use any kind of rope or you could even use a embroidery thread if, you, if that's all you have. What we want to create with this is the ribs that we see on the exterior of a pumpkin. So we're going to be turning this over, crossing over. We're essentially making a pie-like crossover with the jute rope. You're going to want to do it a little bit tightly so that way it will make those pie shapes all the way around a little bit more predominant. Then we're going to tie a little bow at the top and then add a little embellishment just to give it a little bit more character that it looks like a pumpkin just by using twigs that you can find outside in your garden. A large size pumpkin you can start with 35 stitches, medium size 25 and a small size pumpkin you could use 15 stitches. So again whichever you prefer but it is a lot of fun to create. So a friend of mine has found this adorable little desk. It's in really good shape. A couple of little knocks, little dings here and there. But we wanted to kind of reinvent something that would f suit her decor. And I think she really loves the chalk paint and textured look. So I thought I would share this project with you. And I'm going to start with a base coat of French linen. And I'm thinking to do some kind of wash, but probably with a texture. When I start with chalk paint, I always start with a moist paintbrush. Because this particular little desk is quite thin and it's got a lot of thin angles to it, I find that the palm brush that you see me using now is perfect for painting these types of pieces, including the chair. So I'm just going to go and put a base coat of the French linen in two coats and wait for both of them to completely dry before I get into my next step. I find it very helpful to make sure I don't use too much paint on my brush. This way it doesn't get clumpy into the corners and the crevices of the piece that I'm painting, including the chairs. So two thinner coats always really helps. Chalk paint is really thick. And I am actually looking for a textured look. Nothing too strong, but I do want to kind of have random brush strokes and that will really help the next step. Really important to clean your furniture pieces, either with a dish soap, a grease cutting dish soap, Because chalk paint's a water-based paint, it actually adheres really well. But if there is a, some grease or varnish that is on your furniture piece, 
and it's not cleaned well, generally what happens is it almost has what they term a bleed through or the paint doesn't stick well. So just by giving it a good clean really prevents that. So I'm gonna use some shop towels that are moistened and I made a paint wash in the graphite, which is a really dark gray, kind of a black. And what I wanna do is with my moist towels that I've created, I'm going to put the paint wash over my already dried base coat. But instead of wiping back the paint wash, I want to use the moist towel that I've started to actually just dab the paint wash and this is actually going to create a beautiful texture. And you can do this a couple of times. I always use a paint wash of 50% paint, 50% water. You can change the paint and water ratio to change the viscosity of your paint wash. So if you want it to be more transparent or you want it to be more predominant. When I do this technique, I normally let my base coat just dry overnight. That way I know it's sound and cured to do this next step so my paint doesn't pull back. My objective is just to create a very faint texture with this graphite chalk paint wash but if you want to create even more depth and more texture wait for this to dry and do the same wash over again when you're creating a decorative finish using these chalk paints for your furniture it's all about just having some fun just play with it it's just paint if you don't like it it's so easy to go back and change or just go back and start with your base coat again this technique is so easy it is pretty difficult to mess it up you just have to be a little bit patient you're not in a rush and most of all just have fun with it again because the chalk paint is a water-based product i do find it very helpful to have a stir stick or a spoon in my paint wash as i go around and do sections I will refresh the paint wash by giving it a stir because the paint would like to sit at the bottom and the water wants to sit on the top. Once I've completed that and my paint wash is 100% dry, usually only takes about an hour, I will then do a wax. Because I'm going to use a white wax, you don't generally have to use clear wax first. I'm going to apply it with a white wax brush and then any extra and to help buff, I'll use a lint-free cloth, just like this shop towel you see me using. You can add as much white wax or as little as you want, but again, treat it almost like a decorative paint. It's just a wax. You're just applying it just like you would a hand cream. So a little bit here, a little bit there. But the nice part is we, we did create a really nice texture form with the two base coats, then added some texture with the paint wash and the rag. Now I'm adding another texture by letting the wax sit in the low points of the texture created from the base coat of the French linen. So it's a texture, then another texture and a texture on top. And it has a very old world look to it. I love it. I normally apply the white wax in sections, just like I do the paint, and go around and give it a light buff once I'm completed. I happened to pick up these two plastic pumpkins at the dollar store and I got them even for 50% off so I think I paid five dollars for each of them and I thought I'd just play with some paint this is a great way when you're learning how to play with paints you can use regular household paints you could use acrylic paints and all I'm gonna do is mix it as I go with a little bit of baking powder just to create some texture so again, I just want to create some fun, easy fall home decor just with what I already have at home and a little something that I picked up at the dollar store. 
I wasn't sure how much texture I wanted with the baking powder. So I figured it was a safer way to kind of put them side by side and add them and mix them as I go. And this way I can create a little bit of a dusted effect with the baking powder almost sitting on top of the paint once I've applied my first coat. So I'm using French Linen by Annie Sloan, the chalk paint, and I'm also going to use Olive. But like I said, use any paint that you already have. I found this was a great way to play and experiment. So if I found I was putting too much texture, I could take it away a little bit by just adding some paint and kind of bringing it down a little bit. Or if I wanted areas where I did want the texture to be thicker, I actually had that leeway. So this is a great way to have overall control over what you want and play with it. This is the fun part is to play with it. So I just kept going and now I'm making the mix with the baking powder and the olive, doing the exact same thing I did with the French linen. Just from my own experience using the baking powder and the paint to create texture, you don't want to use too much baking powder. It will clump up, it will get dry, and it won't actually adhere properly. So that's why I'm kind of demonstrating by putting a little bit of baking powder and paint side by side. And this way you can get a feel for how much you really should. And this will allow you to be able to adhere the paint with the baking powder and get the texture you want. Just to create a little bit of highlight and low light with one solid color with the olive, I'm now just going to take the baking powder and I'm going to put it into the crevices of the pumpkin just to create highlights. And then I'm going to go back and grab a little bit more of the paint. And then this way I can create a little bit more low light where I want onto the pumpkin. Now, because I'm using the chalk paint, it is really thick. So any of the baking powder that's actually sitting on top of the chalk paint, it's thick and rich enough that it won't fall off once everything is dry. But like I mentioned, just play with it, have some fun. If you want, even want to put two different colors onto the pumpkin, by all means, there's absolutely no rules to this. It's all about just playing and the beauty about this project, it's very inexpensive. You don't need very much paint and baking powder is really, really cheap. What I decided to do because the first pumpkin I did was with the French linen, I found that the baking powder was a little too smoked. It looked funny and I wanted to kind of make everything a little bit more cohesive. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna add in just a touch of the white paint just to make those highlights kind of stand out a little bit more because the French linen is such a neutral base. Again, all I'm doing is just having fun and playing around with it until I like it. I found as I was going that I was trying to come up with a kind of a technique and I guess I would really kind of sum this up to be a little bit of a patina technique for fall decor. So whether it is with pumpkins or other types of thrift finds you have, this is a great painting technique with not a lot of rules to it. This type of texture and the mix will pretty much adhere to almost anything. Glass, ceramic, metal, and as you can see, even plastic. My cat, Dimitri, loves to sit inside anything. Boxes, suitcases, drawers, and as you can see, even bowls. My favorite project to share is a super chunky chenille blankets. And I've been getting a lot of requests to do the double rib blanket. So I used six balls of the Bernat chunky big blanket yarn. So as you can see, it's really thick. 
First thing we're going to do is make a slip knot and I am going to go ahead and start my chain. This is perfect type of knitting style for anybody who has no experience and it's fun. Most of all, you get to create something really beautiful. So they're perfect for gifts or for your own. So I'm going to chain 26 stitches and my stitches are about probably three to four inches in width. So that's how I'm starting off my chain. So when you're pulling the working yarn through, you want to aim for around that three, four inches. You don't want it too tight because then your blanket will start to curl at the end. So you want to try to have a little bit of openness there. What I normally will do is move the yarn in the direction I'm working in. So now that I've made the chain, what I'm going to do now is create my first row of stitches. So I'm going to just use that little bump at the top of every stitch and pull the working yarn through. Again, work around that three, four inches in width. If you've never done this before, I even recommend to maybe make a row of 10 stitches and do a little practice test first. But if you're confident or you have done a little bit of knitting in the past, it's actually really easy. And always remember that slip knot is counted as a stitch. So I'm pulling the working yarn in the direction I'm going. So I'm going left to right. I'm going to start with a basic stitch and I'm going to do two. So my working yarn is underneath. Now I'm going to pull the working yarn on top of the stitch and pull it through. That's what they call a purl stitch. So this is a regular underneath stitch. Then I'm going to do two of those. Then I'm going to do two top stitches, which is actually called the purl stitch. But just to keep this really basic and easy, we're going to call it the under stitch and the over stitch. And you're going to do it in sections of two. So two bottom stitches, two top stitches, two bottom stitches, two top stitches. And this is what's going to create that rib effect as we get into more and more rows. This is going to be what I would call an extra large throw blanket. It's probably the same height as me and I am 5'8". I notice that sometimes these chunky blankets will be for sale on certain um, online shops and they're actually quite small. I much prefer them to be super big. So again, remember, no matter which way you're coming from left to right or right to left with your working yarn, your stitch pattern's always the same. You're going to have two top stitches, two bottom stitches, two top stitches, two bottom stitches. So one is the underneath stitch, which is a regular standard stitch, and then the top stitch is actually a purl stitch. But again, for beginner purposes, let's just keep it basic. So this whole blanket using all six balls of the chunky chenille yarn took me two and a half hours to make this entire blanket. That's how fast this will stitch up. So it's quick and easy, but most of all, it's beautiful. There's nothing more to the pattern other than two lower stitches. So the working yarn comes underneath the stitch and two on upper stitches. So on top of the stitch. So it's just by watching what I'm doing, that's all it is, is two and two, two and two. And as you can start to see now, you can see how there is a raised area and a kind of a concaved area. So this is what they call the double rib effect. A super fun and super easy pattern to follow and it does look really beautiful. If you want to just do a smaller version blanket, then I would suggest maybe three or four balls of this yarn and maybe start out with 15 stitches to cast on. So for this tutorial, I'm actually just making you a sample because the blanket's so big, I wanted everything to fit in the camera. So I'll show you how to hide the tails when you're done, but I do want to show you how to cast off. So you're going to be working as if you're working on a row, but what you're going to do is you're going to grab two stitches, pull the working yarn through, then you'll have one stitch. Pick up another stitch, pull the working yarn through both stitches, then you'll have one stitch. And what you're doing is basically removing a stitch and moving forward. 
But the beautiful part is that all the way around your blanket, it will match. So that's the other thing to quickly mention is you want that underneath stitch as your last stitch on both ends of your blanket because that's what's created to begin with and that's how we're casting off. Once you're done casting off, you're gonna have one stitch left. Pull the working yarn through and you're basically gonna tie a knot and you're going to weave the rest of the tail and you're done. I wanted to share with you how easy it is to make a throw pillow, whether it be for your bed or for your couch. And we're gonna be using the Barnett Big Blanket Chunky Yarn. This time I wanna show you how easy it is to create the seed stitch. So we'll start with a slip knot and we're gonna go ahead and cast on our row of stitches. Now I wasn't sure what I wanted to start with, so I'm gonna be using a 14 by 24 pillow. And I wanted it to be a little bit on the bigger side, but you could use any type of throw pillow. I just recommend that you create your row of stitches based on the length of the pillow. For this particular pillow, because it's 24 in length, I'm going to be using 16 stitches to start. So starting with a chain, I'm going to go and make my first row of official stitches just using the very top bump of each of my chain stitches. Similar startup, just like the blanket, just getting everything started. Starting your first row, again, really easy, just using that very top bump of your chain. And again, my stitches are about three to four inches in width. And remember that cast on stitch that you started, that first loop is also counted as a stitch. So I'm starting my first row of my seed stitch. So similar to the blanket, we did a rib stitching. This time, what we're doing is we are doing a stitch behind one loop and a stitch in front. And it's that's the only part of this pattern. So one stitch in front, one stitch behind with your working yarn. And you're gonna keep repeating this over and over but you're reversing for each row. So again, it's just one stitch in front, one stitch behind, that's it. Once I've done that first row, as you can see, I've already started. Now I'm gonna get into my second row of stitches, but this time I'm gonna be doing it the opposite of what I just did. As I carry to my next row, what was a back stitch is now going to be a front stitch and vice versa. Again, all I'm doing is reversing the exact same stitch pattern I did, but in reverse. So I'm doing it the opposite. What was a front stitch, I'm doing a back stitch and so on. And then when I get into the next row, I'm gonna reverse it back. So each row is a front stitch, back stitch. The next row will be the opposite of the row below it. Because I'm making a throw pillow, you could easily extend your chain out and make a blanket using this exact pattern if you like the look of the seed stitch. One thing I'm doing is making sure that all my borders are going to be the same. So it's always going to be a back stitch on the last stitch of each side. This will make sense when we get to the end. Because our original casting of stitches at the very beginning almost looks like a braid, I want that look to continue on both sides and the top. So just to keep it really easy, just remember that the very last stitch on both ends is always going to be a back stitch. 
because what I'd like to do is create the front panel of the pillow and I'm going to create the exact same thing for the back then we're going to stitch them together so now that I have a few rows going you can see the seed stitch pattern coming together the front and the back panel of this pillow took me a half an hour so the entire throw pillow took me just over an hour to complete the project I ended up using two and a half balls of the big blanket yarn to complete this pillow. Again, to cast off, you're going to take one stitch, grab a stitch, grab your working yarn, pull it through. Now you have one stitch again. Grab one stitch, grab another stitch, pull it through the working yarn. This way you're casting off, so this way we can close the panel of the pillow. And you're also creating the same frame all the way around from the bottom sides and the top. The seed stitch pattern looks very similar on both sides. Now that I'm done the front section, all I'm going to do is cut off the remaining and with the last stitch, pull the working yarn through and create a knot. Just weave the tail in and around the side of it and you won't even see it. It's so thick and bulky. Now that I have both panels to stitch together, you could use the same yarn that you used to create this, but for me, I think I'm going to, because I have it, I'm going to use a chenille yarn that's a little bit thinner of the same color. I also want to show you how, how easy it is by stitching it together that you can always have an opening available so if you wanted to open up the side to take the pillow insert and out and this way you can wash it. These chunky chenille bulky yarns are 100% washable in the machine and the dryer. I am taking the border stitch all the way around each panel and I am just matching them together. So I'm taking that outside braid stitch on each side and I'm just threading the chenille yarn basically into a zigzag, but because everything's so thick and as I keep pulling it in tighter, you won't even see the fact that it's been stitched together. Going into the corners, just as easy as going along the actual panel. You're just going to take that inside of the border stitch on both sides and just carry on just going around and then down to the side. I really love the seed stitch pattern. It has a unique texture and to be able to demonstrate this just using an off-white yarn really shows you the definition of this particular pattern. So again, you can make a blanket, you can make a smaller throw. It is a lot of fun to work with this super chunky chenille yarn. There's so many beautiful things you can create for around your home, and it creates such a warmth and depth as well as beautiful textures. There are 20 to 30 different colors available in the Barnett Big Blanket Chunky Yarn, and I will leave it in my description box below other chunky yarns that are available on Amazon. You can find this super chunky yarn available at the Hobby Lobby in the US and as well as Michael's both in the US and in Canada. Once I finish threading everything, I'm just going to tie a small little bow and then I'm going to tuck it into the corner and this way I can open it to wash anytime. Thank you so much for watching this week's video and please if you have any questions and or comments leave me a comment in the comment box below and if you haven't already hit the subscribe button and notification bell that's going to tell you when i upload my next video and until then take care i'm really looking forward to seeing you soon are you looking forward to seeing them soon i'm looking forward to seeing them soon guys seriously
Are you gonna do the intro? Are you gonna say hello? Are you gonna tell them about what you make? Excuse me. Thank you. We're talking through the projects. Hello. Guys, I can't do intro outro. I know. We, we can't have arguments. No, there's no good time for arguments. Okay, everybody get along. It's all good. Do you want a cookie? Is that what you want? You want a cookie? Guys, come on. It's intro outro. What, are you gonna say it? Hmm? Are you gonna say it? Okay, nobody wants to see that end of you.